the edges of the solar system. Um, so what I have, first of all, thank you very much for all of you being here. Uh, you know, in my eight years of supporting the summer school, this is the first time I'm actually giving a talk. I'm not a teacher. The last time I taught was probably 30 years ago. So bear with me. All the questions that you might have, of course, you have all the professors and teachers here. Save it for them. What I want to do is sort of give you a tour, a motivation uh, for why heliophysics. Heliophysics is a concocted word. It didn't exist as a discipline just but a few years ago. And now we have written textbooks. You've been attending, uh, you know, uh, diligently. The summer school, you're learning, going back, uh, doing postdoc, becoming teachers. So just to provide a framework, a motivation, and what the next three years of the summer school is trying to do, which is to develop, take heliophysics, and apply it in different environment. The comparative astrophysics, the comparative planetology, the world of exoplanets, which has, which has just emerged from observations of Kepler data. So what, what I'm doing here is I recently gave a talk on celebrating 40 years of Skylab, and of course, you, Many of you might not even know what Skylab is. Skylab was the first NASA uh, tended sort of uh, observatory, did a lot of solar physics and astrophysics, I would say, both remote sensing and in-place observations. And so there I gave this talk really how this particular um, orbiter, you know, a small space station, if we may say so, really propelled uh, sort of solar physics into heliophysics, the integrated big picture, and then from there into interplanetary space weather, which is, I think, the next frontier. Um, and and that, so I'm, I'll give you kind of a tour of that. And so this is a picture. I think this is a two-minute picture. Just pay attention to that while I say some other stuff. But this gives you the importance of what's happening on the sun and its impact throughout society. This is a talk, separate talk, by Bill Morta. So why are we doing this? I think you know human society's vulnerability to solar flares and CMEs as our environment continues to expand is very evident when you look at what's going on uh, with the impact that we have in today's technological society. We have a permanent presence of human in Earth orbit and eventually human voyages uh, beyond Earth. Solar variability can affect human space flight, uh, satellite operations, smart power grids, GPS navigation, emergency radio communications, air travel, financial services, and even terrestrial climate. If you can think it, it's as if it can be affected. Anything that has uh, a sort of uh, electromagnetic switch in it has the potential to be affected by heliophysics or solar storms. Um, And this all actually started with Skylab. As you will see, uh, this, I think, particular um, picture ends. And these are showing you all the technological impacts, essentially, you know, uh, precision equipment um, during farming or on the ocean. These all can be affected by space weather. And the motivation for space weather, the science, is really helio. Physics. I'm going to go on to the next slide. And, and so what you see here, you know, space weather, very simply defined, refers to magnetic disturbances and uh, high radiation levels that result from solar activity. Aurora power outages and radio blackouts are some of the many manifestations of these activities. Human civilization has now extended from the physical domain of the Earth, where we live, to the neighboring domain of the heliosphere, which is really controlled by sun's gravity and magnetic field. Space-based commerce and government infrastructure has grown so explosively in the past half uh, century, I would say, that satellites are actually beginning to run into each other. And we have some examples of that. Furthermore, humans have been living continuously in the heliosphere on International Space Station for the past decade and more now. And this human presence will only increase. 
So in some ways, we are no longer simply absorbing some domain beyond our reach. We must now gain that level of understanding, I think, required to develop and inhabit a new environment. And that's what heliophysics teaches. This is a daunting graph. <laughs> Don't be scared. I think your professors will show more of this. I just illustrate this almost like a cartoon. You know, this is a prototype picture for studying, you know, the sun earth, the sun planet, or stellar exoplanet system. The picture is not to scale. It is 93 million miles. I mean, that, that, that's huge, mind-bogglingly huge for us. And in this, if you can see, you know, the Earth, that little pale blue dot, actually is enveloped in the sun's expanding outer atmosphere, which is the solar corona. In that sense, the name of the program that I oversee, Living with the Star, is literally true. We are actually living in the outer atmosphere of our um, star. The sun is coupled to a planetary system uh, by radiation, charged particles, and magnetic fields. And these are modulated over um, you know, many different scales, the most common being 11-year solar cycle that you are very fam familiar with. You know, it goes up and down, you know, moods of the sun, peak, trough, and, and you can see that the effects that we feel because of that mod modulation are becoming more severe or known in the way of space weather today, simply because technology is beginning to be affected uh, by this. The study of heliophysics involves three forces. You know, two are very familiar to us you know, when we deal with terrestrial weather, which is pressure and gravity. What makes heliophysics really unique is the third force, magnetic field. You can't see it, you can't touch it, but you know it exists. Imaginary lines, that, that's how we study them, right, when we are doing electromagnetic forces. And the combination of these three forces makes heliophysics into something that is a bit exotic for a discipline. It is a combination of meteorology and astrophysics together. So meteorology is terrestrial weather. Astrophysics is sun as a star. The combination of the two is heliophysics. So the science is rich complicated, and the effects are really vast, but very interesting. And I'll probably come back to this theme again, just to drive this point home, because what you're going to learn here, it, it's a very broad interdisciplinary sign. You have to learn many different aspects of physics in order to make sense or start solving problems. So, but you can, of course, choose certain areas within this broad field. Heliophysics is a systems approach. You know, if I hadn't already said that enough number of times, it does not focus on any region of space, but rather on our sun planet region as one system. So you start with the solar dynamo, and you know, if you read the chapters in volume one and two, you'll get the basic physics that's entailed in heliophysics. Not going to talk about that. And then from that is generated various solar outputs that are modulated by 11-year solar cycle and other relevant time scales. And then the various solar outputs are broken up into various spectral range of radiation you know, near ultraviolet, visible, infrared, X-rays, extreme ultraviolet, energetic particles, which are these solar wind particles, you know, which has both uh, charge as well as mass. And then uh, solar wind, as I uh, mentioned there. And you can see how those lines that have been drawn kind of show you which radiation affects which layers of our planetary environment. Now remember, this, is, this cartoon is for Earth, but every planet will have its own planetary environment, and this will change accordingly. <laughs> What you see out there on the far uh, right-hand corner, galactic cosmic rays, that's not of solar 
energy, but it is the sun's magnetic bubble that allows the penetration of galactic cosmic rays, which are produced during, uh, you know, uh, annihilation of uh, stellar uh, systems. These particles come through the Milky Way galaxy, interstellar medium, and they penetrate the magnetic bubble of the heliosphere, and they are higher charge particles that can have more effect on us. So anyway, the important point to remember is that uh, the, the study is about the connection between the regions and how one sort of drives a response in another. It's a system study. So how did all this gets started, you know, heliophysics is not starting as brand new in some sense. It's one of the oldest of disciplines. It's just that we are making this connection and presenting it in a very coherent manner. So this is sort of sun or system science growth from uh, consuming science to a producing science. And uh, what do we mean by that? It is not just curiosity driven science, but it is also science that has relevance to life and society. And that makes it stand apart from other kinds of science. And this started a long time ago, you know, first international polar year in 1982, and which went after synoptic observations, network of polar stations. You know, as technology became available, uh, scientists started doing more and more um, experiments. You know, map phenomena came into existence. Second international polar year, 1932, added a third dimension, explore upper atmosphere, then you go into International Geophysical Year, 1957, um, year of the Sputnik launch also, you know, added Antarctica and space, explore space. You can see how this phenomenon is developing. International Quiet Sun Year, 1984, add solar minimum, complementary IGY, complement IGY, which is the International Geophysical Year. International Magnetospheric Study, 1976, your study system complexity. Solar Terrestrial Energy Program, 1990, add numerical modeling. We are systematically, we were developing this, it seems like. Study integrated interactive system. National Space Weather Program, this is the first time the word space weather was used. Came into existence in 1995. Applications directed science. This is the first time we started using that word relevant to life and society. This was largely an effort started by National Science Foundation Community Coordination. Living with the Star Program started in 2000 as a NASA initiative. Again, applications directed science, the same science, and this was a NASA community uh, coordination. And finally, International Heliophysical Year in the year 2007, following in the footsteps of IGY. Add comparative heliospheric studies, universalize heliospheric structure and processes, fundamental science. Okay, that, and this was a two-year program sanctioned by United Nations. So this is about evolution of system studies. And what you can see there is really growth from international polar year to the very large bubble on the right-hand corner, which is the entire solar system. Okay, so heliophysical, a broadening of the concept, geophysical, which is our planet, geospace, extending the connections from the Earth to the sun and interplanetary space. Our Understanding began with a very local view, and as technology developed and international coordination grew, we began to view the Earth as more of a system, and that's where we are. You know, Earth science is very much like that, right? That does terrestrial weather, very system-driven. That's where heliophysics is going. Why heliophysics? So heliophysics is the study of the physical domain defined by the sun, the heliosphere, just like astrophysics is the study of the physics domain, physics, physical domain defined by stars. This physical domain includes the sun itself, the solar wind, and stretches out to the start of interstellar medium where we have the Voyager spacecraft, and I'm sure somebody here will talk to you about the exciting science going on there. 
So in principle, heliophysics studies everything inside the sun's domain of influence. As I already mentioned, heliophysics is an environmental science and a unique hybrid between meteorology and astrophysics. And I am repeating this because these are really important concepts. It has an applied branch, which is the space weather, started in 1995, and living with the star, that started in 2000, and a pure branch, just the plasma physics processes that most of you are interested in, that was kind of propelled into existence during the international um, heliophysical year. So how did Skylab really contribute to heliophysics, what were some of those game changers that Skylab introduced back in 1973, 1974? The corona is hot and controlled by magnetic fields, and you're going to learn a lot more about that. And, and what were they measuring? They were measuring X-ray and extreme ultraviolet rays and their variability on Earth. High-speed solar wind originates from coronal holes. Solar particles impact Earth. These were the concepts that were being driven home from the Skylab observations and its impact on Earth. Mass from the corona is ejected into interplanetary space. These are the coronal mass ejections, right? Both uh, mass and momentum at a tremendous speed. So solar catastrophic events can impact Earth's magnetosphere. Three very important points from Skylab. I'll give you another concept of, yes. Absolutely, I am a graduate student of HAO, as a matter of fact. And my thesis work, a big chunk of it, was utilizing Skylab observations. Thank you. And yes, some of those film are here. It, it's, yes, it, it, it's history today. That would be. And in fact, is, if Gang is here, maybe she can organize something. She's the direct, uh, acting director of High Altitude Observatory. So I, I kind of want to still go on on the theme of heliophysics and kind of tie it also to the organization of the universe. And, and, and that, that kind of, it, it's, it, it's, it's given in a sense kind of showing, you know, um, phenomena that are sort of uh, affected by gravity, phenomena that are affected by magnetic field. You have astro and solar below. You have gravitational organization where you see universe, galaxies, stars, solar systems, planetary systems, question of origins, life on planets, and then you go to the plasma astrophysics where heliophysics falls, uh, you know, magnetic organizations, solar connections, and, and he, uh, that branch actually talks more about destinies, life around and between planets, habitability of planets. You know, the universe is filled with electrically conducting gas, right? Ionized gas called plasma. Exceptions are what? They are planetary atmospheres, you know, we reside on one, and some dense interstellar clouds. So in, in that sense, we also live in a magnetic universe. Now, we may presume that most stars are magnetically active like the sun, but the sun is the only star available for direct study here. And, and so, Examples of gravitationally organized matter, we have already given planet, star, galaxies, and magnetically organized matter are sunspots, magnetosphere, stellar and galactic spiral fields, uh, galactic plumes. So knowledge of heliophysics in that sense can be applied to this, to this organization right here. Another, and I'm not going to dwell very long on this, are things that you are going to learn here, really exploiting uh, parallels between helio, astro, planetary, and earth signs. In fact, there are you know, undergraduate teachers here. We were even having questions about solar stellar connections or uh, comparative planetology. You know, we know quite a bit about sun and its impact on our planet. What happens if we look at Venus, Mars, Jupiter? Those are the comparative planetology. 
And, you know, it wouldn't be fair for me to say uh, that it is easy. It is not easy. It, it's, it's hard work. You have to study hard. You have to take really difficult classes for many of these because this is a very complex system with many different temporal and spatial scales. This is a multi-scale system. And these couples between scales a very uh, you know, interesting graph that uh, Professor Gambosi actually drew up a long time ago to illustrate his point to his students, really. And you can see you know, the scale there, the uh, temporal scale going from one second to 100 AU. One second is a solar flare phenomenon or auroral zone phenomenon. 100 AU is what we are beginning to see at uh, the Voyager time scale. Uh, and, and so what are we looking from this sort of study? We are, we are really after a quantitative, predictive understanding of this complex system. It's quantitative, predictive, so you know that it has to be absolutely rigorous. So I just leave you with that. But this, these are the kind of processes we are trying to uh, study, create models, and continue on. Very simple picture, you know, some of the phenomenon happening on the sun, solar flares, coronal mass ejections, high speed streams. And what are their impact on the space weather phenomenon on Earth? And you can see solar flare causes radio blackout, um, or it can cause radiation storm, which is high energy uh, particles, which can affect human health and satellites. Coronal mass ejections actually have effect on radiation storm, as well as geomagnetic storm, which is all the phenomenon that we feel in terms of power grid outages, scintillations in ionosphere, uh, loss of communication, navigation satellite, et cetera, and high-speed solar wind, which happens pretty much continuously, sometimes gusty as high-speed solar wind, and sometimes just slow solar wind. And they also have their effects you know, in generating radiation storm and geomagnetic storm. And you're going to hear more about this from uh, Bill Marta, who is at NOAA Space Weather Prediction Center, who will really tie in the impact of heliophysics. A quick overview of heliophysics observatory. And this is not complete. It's a little dated. We have more satellites there. But this gives you a picture of all the different kinds of satellites you know, really in different orbit, different vantage point. Some are remote sensing. Some are in place in situ observations that essentially provides the observational foundation that then dictates, uh, dictates theoretical uh, validation of our models and um, I'll, I'll show you essentially uh, well let's let you can see this picture because it will eventually sort of give you the envelope the magnetosphere and and in that context where these satellites are located now remember some of these satellites are actually observing the Sun these are remote sensing observations if only we can have all those <laughs> someday, someday, but why Jupiter? We're not going to live there. <laughs> See, this is what happens. And, and so this is, this, is, this is sort of a schematic of the various um, satellites you saw there. I think the missions that we say in development, which are yellow, have actually launched, except for MMS, which will be launching next year, and then the missions in development are Solar Orbiter, Solar Probe Plus, and I see that I'm missing uh, ICON and GOAL. Those are our two brand new missions that are really looking at the ionosphere, thermosphere region. And remember, you have to study each of these regions with observations in order to really create that system science. The next four or five charts, I have them, but I'm not going to talk to them, as I said, because you're going to have someone else talk about the impact. So I'm just going to scroll through it. You know, you can see you know, how heliophysics affects all of these areas. So let me go now to where we are with the solar cycle. You know, solar activity is so low that solar max looks a lot like solar min. I mean, 
really, and if you plot it over a very long time period, you'll see how low the solar activity is. So you, you, you may think that because this is a low solar cycle, that perhaps we don't need to kind of worry about our technology, that it is safe. And, uh, Let's see if that's true or not. But before I go there, I kind of also, we've talked about the space weather phenomenon, but did not really address the sun climate connection. Climate is just as important, a phenomenon that is driven by the sun. Now, climate in the NASA um, domain is something that Earth science practices, but we absolutely interact in terms of climate variability, climate also is now being utilized more and more when we look at other planets. It's a longer term phenomenon as opposed to the shorter term space weather activity. And what you find here is on, on this uh, left hand side, the plot there shows total solar irradiance, uh, ultraviolet, extreme ultraviolet, and you can see that in cycle 24, these are phenomenally reduced and this must have an impact on our planetary environment as well as climate. What is really more interesting is the, the ratio of spectral solar irradiance from solar max to solar min. If you look at that little green straight line there, that is the ratio of visible light, which is kind of comes out during total solar irradiance measurements. That variability is only 0.1%. One one tenth, very small. But if you look at the blue in the UV, that is huge, and that variability can be up to 100. And sometimes it is not just a ratio between solar mean and solar max. Sometimes it can happen within a day if there's a big solar flare going on. And th those are the radiations that is absorbed in our cyanosphere, mesosphere, thermosphere, various different layers. So it's very important. Okay. So we are so used to seeing solar cycle plot, right, as sort of an x-axis plot modulating, maximum, minimum. And we always think solar max is a time when all hell is breaking loose. That's really not true. And in order to drive that point, what we have done here is we have actually changed the orientation of solar cycle. So you have no bearing on max and minimum. All you have are two extremes of solar cycle. So the red there is high sunspot number. The blue is low sunspot number. To be cute, you know, we've kind of compared it with La Nina and El Nino. But what you're seeing that on the, on the red side, there are, what do we have? We have super solar flares going on. We have extreme solar cosmic rays. These are the solar energetic particles. Phenomenon that happens are radio blackouts, extreme geomagnetic storms, uh, melted power grids, etc. Now, during the low phase of the solar cycle, it, it's not quiet. There are other things going on. Extreme galactic cosmic rays, rapid accumulation of space junk because the ionosphere configuration has changed, sharp contraction of the heliosphere, collapse of the upper atmosphere, and total solar irradiance changes going down has an effect on climate. And so those are the big phenomenon out there during a solar max event, right? We are talking about melted power grid from extreme geomagnetic storm. Talking about that again, is this a phenomenon only during large cycles, during the peak of solar cycle? Let's investigate that. So there was a very extreme event called the Carrington event in 1859. We believe we haven't seen anything like this, at least not on this planet. And sometimes, you know, especially in 1859, where we didn't have the wealth of observations we have today, what we had were ground-based magnetometers, or we had the sighting of auroral oval. The further south the auroral oval is observed, or the auroral display, right, the aurora borealis, the stronger is the geomagnetic storm. So in this particular case, you can see that we were actually way below in the southern latitude. And if you can see that lower graph there, you will find that there was a magnetometer that's in red in Bombay at a latitude of, I don't know, um, 
barely above um, uh, equator, you know, uh, where there was, uh, where we had actually measured the magnetic field, ground-based magnetometer, from this Carrington event. So this is one of the largest event in the history, uh, for which we have enough observations that we are beginning to piece this together. So when did this particular event take place? The largest geomagnetic storms on record occurred not during peak of solar cycle or large solar uh, cycles, but during lower than average solar cycles. And the two red bubbles, if you can see them, are 1859 storm and 1921 storm. They, they, were, they, they were pretty significant. And guess what? We are actually in one of those rare weak cycles. I'm not drawing any correlation, but just to make the point that these things can happen any time, any cycle. So this solar cycle is even smaller. Where is our Carrington event? Yeah, I knew you'd ask that question, even though I've said, you know, it doesn't mean that we have to have one. Well, the question is, did we actually have a Carrington event? Maybe. There is no way to clearly prove it because this particular event was not Earth directed. This was the July 23rd uh, event of a coronal mass ejection that really was traveling at a speed of about 3,500 kilometers per second. This was observed by not Sun Earth line satellites, but by stereo satellite, which is actually at a different vantage point uh, from the Sun Earth line. And this particular um, CME affected the stereo A satellite, but also stereo A satellite was able to take uh, observations. So is it possible that a solar, a solar superstorm just narrowly missed Earth? And there are a lot of very interesting work that has gone on, um, which um, are telling us perhaps we had something very big that we escaped. These are just some of the pictures from the stereo observations. You know, this is the, these are the coronagraph images, and the white speckles there are essentially the telescope detectors are getting overwhelmed by energetic uh, particles. And what you see here is essentially uh, computer models that use these observations and then generate uh, propagating CME into the interplanetary medium. That's, like, that's what you're looking at. This gives you a picture of where stereo A was, where Earth is, and how huge this particular coronal mass ejection was. OK, so let's now go back to extreme galactic cosmic rays. It's, it's the essentially La Nina phase, the low sunspot number phase, which is where we are today. Let's look at the heliosphere. So just as Earth is protected from solar energetic particles by its uh, magnetosphere similarly, and then that's right up there on that corner. The heliosphere is protected, uh, the solar system is protected from galactic cosmic rays by this magnetic bubble called the heliosphere, and that's what you're looking at essentially. And, and so how does that work? During solar minimum, what we have, I think I had another plot, but it's somehow not here. During solar minimum, um, the heliosphere contracts, the magnetic field is simpler, and during solar maximum, the heliosphere expands. It's like the heliosphere as if it's breathing. And, and so the sol galactic cosmic rays have easier time penetrating the heliosphere during a weak low solar cycle, solar cycle or during solar minimum than it does during a strong solar cycle or solar maximum. Now, why, why should we care about that, what happens? It, it's because, you know, as I mentioned, when solar activity is low, cosmic rays are able to invade the inner solar system. It not only gets to the inner solar system, if there are satellites or someday even uh, human astronauts, they'll be affected by this. And, and this is a plot, I believe from one of our satellites, ACE, that's showing 
in that blue dotted plot how cosmic rays have really gone off the scale during the solar cycle because of the weakening solar cycle. And remember that cosmic rays are not product of the solar system, but of the interstellar medium. Why is this important? Why do we need to know? I think this is, this is really a very interesting uh, plot. So what you're seeing there is that um, radiation exposure for human exploration. It is not a question of if, but when, that we will see human astronauts leave low Earth orbit and venture out into the solar system. It will happen. My lifetime, I don't know. I think that in your lifetime, definitely. So as demonstrated by MSL, uh, this is, this is a Mars um, Science Laboratory experiment. Uh, what, what you are looking at here um, is, th this is the assessment detector measurements. Uh, the cancer risk of crew members in deep space is caused by mostly by GCRs. And this is the plot that you have to look at that is really important. So here is an integrated dose equivalent in some particular um, you know, unit. And what you're finding is what MSL RAD instrument has measured. So during the cruise phase, solar energetic particle is pretty high, the dark blue. But if you look at the galactic cosmic ray during the cruise phase, it's much higher, factor of 10. If you look at what happens on the surface of Mars, for example, you see it? No. Is it the lower one? Oh, this one. No. So uh, this is this is during this the cruise space. Huh. Yeah, that's it. This is the surface solar energetic particle effect on the surface, minuscule. But if you look at what happens uh, to galactic cosmic rays on surface, for whether it is. Uh, satellite or whether it's astronauts, it's huge. These are the kind of things we have to keep in mind. And the fact that galactic cosmic rays are modulated by the solar cycle. So solar mean in some ways is a safer time to travel beyond our low Earth orbit, yes. It, it's actually going up, still going up. That, that's what I think. I will look it up and show you, yes. And finally, you know, during periods of low solar activity, cosmic rays pose a threat not only to astronauts, but also to ordinary air travelers. And this must resonate with all of us, right? Uh, 100,000 miles frequent flyer receives a dose equivalent of 20 checks to X-rays. One chest X-ray is something that we here on Earth receive over 20 days from natural stuff, you know, radon gas in building, uh, secondary effect of neutrons, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we are getting a lot more, you know, 200 days worth, you know, if you are a 100,000 miles flyer, and this is happening, you know, at mid latitude. If you are going over poles from Chicago to say Beijing a 13-hour flight during a low activity period, you could potentially get a lot more. You can get sort of two days of uh, chest x-rays in 13 hours. And you might ask the question, you know, so why should we care? I mean, you know, we don't feel it immediately, but we also know that exposure to x-rays has its effect on you know, cataract risk, other cancers, et cetera. But this is, this is an area of study. So what about people in space or interplanetary space? You know? So this is, again, an active field of research that you will participate and inform the rest of the world, I think, someday. So let's start with now the whole concept of interplanetary space, whether, would someone tell me how much time I have? So, okay. Um, so, the fact that we are able to actually predict 
in some sense, or in form, interplanetary space weather. You know, space prediction of space weather itself was a challenge, you know, a decade or two ago. We didn't have sufficient observations or model. Now we are talking of interplanetary space weather. It's simply because we have really surrounded the sun with our satellites. Stereo A and B launched in 2006, you know, which are drifting away from the sun earth line at a rate of about 22.5 degrees. And they are actually almost close to being behind the sun as we are talking of. And of course, Solar Dynamics Observatory and Solar and SOHO. These are the spacecraft that allow us to view the sun continuously, uh, really, and three-dimensionally. We can see the far side of the sun. If you have iPhone or Android, you can download an app called 3D Sun, and you can get what the sun is doing, even on the far side, in the palm of your hand. And this is, these observations have made interplanetary space weather possible and a new concept. And this is essentially a picture from Solar Dynamics Observatory. I'd be remiss if I didn't show you the fabulous observations that we are getting from Solar Dynamics Observatory. Of course, we are showing here just one quarter of the sun. That's a filament eruption. But we are getting this at a rapid cadence uh, per minute at a very, very high resolution, IMAX resolution. That is changing uh, our physics and also exactly what is going out into the interplanetary medium. So that's kind of the beginning, I would say, of interplanetary space weather um, concept, which we call a new paradigm. So if, if you, if you um, look at this, you know, I'm going to read these yellow lines here. Probes are now orbiting or en route to Mercury, Venus, the Moon, Mars, Sirius, Saturn, and Pluto. And it is only a matter of time before astronauts are out there too. This is important. And this, this really uh, sort of came home during a phenomenal event in March 2012, which we call the St. Patrick's Day event that took place over a two week period. This is that active region that really produced this effect. There were some 50 flares that took place, three of which were of the highest measure uh, x-rays. And then we were able to take, essentially, these uh, observations, put it into our model through supercomputer, and you can see what the CME is doing here. And again, these are this is Earth, which is right here. Uh, various satellites, Stereo A, B, Spitzer, various uh, planets. So you can see if a particular planet is going to be affected by these events or not. Uh, there were about 15 NASA satellites that were affected by this phenomenon. So what did we learn from there? I think we, we are at a stage that development that you saw, the computer model, for example, observations, is, is very similar to some of the first satellite images of hurricane that we took in the terrestrial weather, and also the hurricane forecasting, which is really modeling that effort. So tropospheric weather you know, is storm tracking, is essential for midterm forecasting. And, and this picture here essentially is showing you that weather in the Midwest is Washington's weather tomorrow. Washington, our nation's capital, it's important. We know what's going on there, whether or not. And, and so what's equivalent of space weather in that? You know, it's that coronal mass ejection, you know, tracking is essential for midterm forecasting. That's what we are seeing. And this is a coronal mass ejection plot. Uh, that you are looking at. And these kind of observations then allow us to create the models which can go out throughout the solar system. This is very interesting. So this is the stereo uh, mission and the heliospheric imagers in stereo mission. And uh, what, what stereo uh, HI imagers are trying to do is really uh, measure something that is so faint that it is almost imper imperceptible, and they have done that. You know, this is actually measuring something at a magnitude of the sun, right? 27 magnitude to 
uh, minus 27, 13th magnitude star. What this set of imagers are doing is measuring a bright solar flare to something like an asteroid, which is charcoal black. It, it's sort of the order of magnitude in this image compared to human eyes of the order of 10 billion. Uh, you know, there is nothing, no observatory that is capable of doing that. And so you're seeing the sun surface, and all the way down here is Earth, and even the Earth is imaged by these um, imagers. And so the next frontier in space weather forecasting uh, involves the uninterrupted tracking of storm clouds from the sun to the planet. So the same picture that you saw in a different coordinate, they have been squished. Essentially, you're seeing a coronal mass ejection. Here is again Earth. You can almost begin to see the tangled magnetic field that we want to understand in an interplanetary coronal mass ejection. These are very important development. Very quickly. Again, for NASA, reasons for developing this predictive capability may be divided into three pressing re uh, reasons. Human safety, talked about it, it's interplanetary travel, spacecraft operations, but scientific research, I think, is probably the uh, greatest beneficiary. Since I'm running out of time, I'm not going to talk a lot about this, but there is lunar space weather that we have observed and now understand. You know, these are again um, uh, phenomenon that uh, essentially the lunar dust interacting with, um, with uh, solar uh, wind particles as well as radiation. Why, why would a predictive capability help any uh, orbiting mission, it is simply because that if we knew that a coronal mass ejection or a big storm is coming in a particular direction, whether it's moon, Mars, or any other place, then perhaps the instruments there have a capability to adjust their rates of measurement, you know, burst mode or viewing angle, uh, any number of things. So you can collect the maximum amount of data during this time frame. Same thing here, you know, these are important in support of Mars mission. Mars's magnetic field is not global like Earth's. It, it's actually in pockets of umbrella right here and quite dominant in the south. So a CME interaction with Mars actually gives rise to auroral ovals in these umbrellas. Uh, our new mission, MAVEN, is going to benefit significantly from uh, getting this feedback, predictive feedback, of when a coronal mass ejection uh, uh, you know, is traveling in their way. Space weather at Mercury. Mercury actually has a much higher rate of magnetic reconnection than we have that than we have observed on our planet. Uh, CME uh, interaction with Mercury's uh, magnetosphere can be lethal. These are the areas essentially of comparative planetology that others will talk to you about. I just show you some uh, plots here. You know, this gives you essentially schematics of magnetospheres on in different environments and I know Professor Bagnell has much better pictures and she will show you those pictures and the, these are essentially uh, you know comparative magnetosphere ionospheres from different sets of satellites going back to Skylab now I want to end my talk with Skylab Skylab and Venus so suppose we were able to put Skylab, like Orbiter, has to be better, you know, retrofitted, technologically advanced, etc. What, what would Skylab really find? I mean, what's happening in Venus is phenomenal. You know, reverse shocks called hot flow anomalies above the atmosphere of Venus now can suck the planet's ionosphere into space and locally reverse the direction of the solar wind, sending material back toward the sun. This is what some scientists are theorizing. You know, if you put a Skylab-like orbiting uh, uh, observatory there, then 
these, um, uh, the orbiter could actually sample these events locally. I'll give you another example, and if, you know, Sky, uh, Pluto is very much on everyone's mind these days because New Horizon will be arriving there shortly. And so what would we learn uh, if there was a sky lab at Pluto? You know, Pluto is very far from the sun, and it, is, um, it still experiences CMEs. We know that even though the CME speeds kind of reduces significantly, but it's still going to be perceptible. And we know that. How do we know that? Because voyagers are actually experiencing CMEs. So what would Skylab experience at Pluto? Would it see a darkening of Pluto's surface as solar energetic particles interact with goop on the ground to produce organic material? Would it detect Plutonian auroras? I mean, we'll know that next year, we hope. At present, we don't even know if Pluto has a magnetic field, and I don't know. Uh, Professor Beganel might have some ideas that haven't been published yet. Mm -hmm. New Horizons will give us a glimpse of space weather at Pluto next year. So you can see how you can take space weather heliophysics and apply it in entirely different environment. And then you have Professor Cohen who will give you a really uh, solar system exoplanet connection. And th this is just fascinating. This is extreme space weather on closing exoplanets, a simulation. And this is for living with a red dwarf program, as it has been called. And what you're looking there, you know, in red, red dwarf, a planet can be much closer to the parent star, unlike our own star. And what happens is these red dwarfs can have very large sunspots. And if you kind of really begin to model this environment, what a coronal mass ejection would look, what you're seeing is that, that poor exoplanets, um, you know, outer atmosphere is annihilated essentially uh, through this CME interaction. So the habitability zone of an exoplanet in a given environment is again something that this community of scientists can begin to address. This is sort of the same model, but showing uh, sort of exomagnetic impact. This is, these, these are, um, I believe, uh, auroral ovals, which is just not at the poles, but all over the surface. So it, 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 it's really phenomenal that we can take our physics and apply it to different conditions and begin to create realistic enough images, which someday we might be able to observe. Now, talking about exoplanet, we haven't even been to a star yet. You know, we have been to all the planets, the extreme reaches of the solar system, but we haven't visited a star. Well, we are going to change that very soon. In 2018, NASA will launch a mission called Solar Pro Plus that will actually be humanity's first mission to a star. And it is going to go to within a distance of 10 solar radii of the sun. This is where you see the coronal mass ejections, you know, blowing out. The solar wind from being slow speed to high speed becoming asymptotic. And I'm, you know, I'll be happy to talk to all of you about this mission later on. I can't dwell on it very much. But this is going to launch in 2018. It's going to have 24 orbits, get multiple <coughs> Venus gravity assist to get to its closest distance after at the end of seven years, which is 10 solar radii, to address two of the fundamental mysteries in heliophysics. Why is the corona so hot? And you know what provides the momentum for solar wind to accelerate on? And then, since all of you are students and dreamers, I'm sure, I will end this talk with, you know, Think of a sky lab in another stellar system. And that might not be you know, such a far off idea. I mean, in such a context, would sky lab even need a coronagraph to detect a bright red dwarf CME from the close range of the system's Goldilocks zone? We don't know. Thank you.